A Northern Light by Jennifer Donnelly. A first chapter Friday read aloud with the word nerd. Today as you listen, watch for the story quote that will appear on screen. Write it down word by word and then follow the instructions given to you by your teacher. Before we dive into the first chapter today, I just want to note that most of the books I share with you on this channel are for middle grade audiences, but this book, A Northern Light, as well as a few others, are more appropriate for more mature readers, and I recommend them for grades 8 and up. Hi, my name is Amanda Zeba. Welcome to my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd, and another First Chapter Friday video. Today I'm going to be reading you the first chapter of the book called A Northern Light by Jennifer Donnelly. And if that last name or that author's name sounds familiar to you, I wouldn't be surprised because Jennifer is one of those amazing authors that writes for a wide variety of ages. For example, have you heard of the picture book Humble Pie? Or maybe you've heard of some of her other books like Deep Blue, or another YA story, Revolution. I first discovered Jennifer when I read her adult book called The Tea Rose. And then when I was working as a middle school reading teacher and I went into the library and I found A Northern Light, I was thrilled to know that one of my favorite authors had written other stories. So here's your little PSA. If you find an author that you like, Research to see what else they've written because you might be able to come across an entire treasure trove of stories um, just waiting for you. And what is really cool about Jennifer in particular and other authors as well is that they do write for different age groups so you can enjoy that author's work um, from the time you're a kid until the time that you are a grown up. You can see that lots of other people have uh, really enjoyed this particular book because it uh, has won the Prince Award in addition to many other things. Um, it was a Junior Library Guild selection, a New York Public Library book for the teenagers, um, a Publishers Weekly Best Book of the Year. It is fantastic. Here's what the back of the book has to say. 16-year-old Maddie Goki has big dreams, but little hope of seeing them come true. Desperate for money, she takes a job at the Glenmore, where hotel guest Grace Brown asks her to burn a bundle of secret letters. But when Grace's drowned body is fished from the lake, Maddie discovers the letters reveal the grim truth behind a murder. Set in 1906 against the backdrop of the murder that inspired Theodore Drescher's An American Tragedy, this astonishing novel weaves romance, history, and a murder mystery into something moving, real, and wholly original. Uh, now, I didn't get the chance to interview Jennifer, uh, although I would have loved to, but in the back of this particular book, um, it does have a reader chat page and author interview, so you can get that experience um, for yourself. I chose to read this book in October because I'm kind of going with like a mystery, creepy, kind of spooky theme for the month of Halloween, um, and so this book definitely delivers on that. Before we begin, I want to tell you one other thing. Some of the chapters at the top begin with a word. Um, for example, at the chap top of chapter two, it's factitious. Other words that appear are misnomer or monochromatic or glean or abscission. And uh, the word nerd in me just loved the fact that I would be running off to my dictionary to figure out what these words were. And it kept me reading and intrigued to see how it was going to play a role in the chapter ahead. So. Um, tons of, of little aspects of mystery throughout the whole story, and I just know you're going to love it. When summer comes to the north woods, time slows down, and some days it stops altogether. The sky, gray and lowering for much of the year, becomes an ocean of blue so vast and brilliant you can't help but stop what you're doing, pinning wet sheets to the line maybe, or shucking a bushel of corn on the back steps to stare up at it. Locusts were in the birches, coaxing you out of the sun and under the boughs, and the heat stills the air heavy and sweet with a scent of balsam. As I stand here on the porch of the Glenmore, the finest hotel on all of Big Moose Lake, I tell myself that today, July 12th, 1906, is such a day. Time has stopped, and the beauty and calm of this perfect afternoon will never end. The guests up from New York, all in their summer whites, will play croquet on the lawn forever. Old Mrs. Ellis will stay on the porch until the end of time, wrapping her cane on the railing for more lemonade. The children of doctors and lawyers from Utica, Rome, and Syracuse will always run through the woods, laughing and shrieking, giddy from too much ice cream. I believe these things with all my heart, for I am good at telling myself lies. Until Ada Bouchard comes out at the doorway and slips her hand into mine, and Mrs. Morrison, the manager's wife, walks right by us, pausing at the top of the steps. 
At any other time, she'd scorch our ears for standing idle. Now she doesn't seem to even know we're here. Her arms cross over her chest, her eyes gray and troubled, fastened on the dock, and the steamer tied alongside it. That's the Zilpha, ain't it, Maddie? Ada whispers. They've been dragging the lake, ain't they? I squeeze her hand. I don't think so. I think they were just looking along the shoreline. Cook says they probably got lost, that couple. Couldn't find their way back in the dark and spent the night under some pines, that's all. I'm scared, Maddie, ain't you? I don't answer her. I'm not scared. Not exactly. I can't explain how I feel. Words fail me sometimes. I've read almost every one in the Webster's International Dictionary of English Language, but I still have trouble making them come to me when I want them to. Right now, I want a word that describes the feeling you get, a cold, sick feeling deep down inside when you know something is happening that will change you and you don't want it to, but you can't. Stop it. And you know for the first time, for the very first time, that there will be a before and an after, a was and a will be, and that you will never again be quite the same person you were. I imagine it's the feeling Eve had as she bit into the apple, or Hamlet when he saw his father's ghost, or Jesus as a boy right after someone sat him down and told him his pa wasn't a carpenter after all. What is the word for that feeling? For knowledge and fear and loss all mixed together? Frisdom? Dreadnaciousness? Malbomnascence? Standing on that porch under that flawless sky with the bees buzzing lazily and the roses and a cardinal calling from the pines so sweet and clear, I tell myself that Ada's a little nervous hen, always worrying when there's no cause. Nothing bad can happen at the Glenmore, not on a day such as this. And then I see Cook running up from the dock, ashen and breathless, her skirts in her hands, and I know that I am wrong. Maddie, open the parlor, she shouts, heedless of the guests. Quick, girl. I barely hear her. My eyes are on Mr. Crabb, the Zilfa's engineer. He is coming up the path carrying a young woman in his arms. Her head lolls against him like a broken flower and water drips from her skirt. Oh, Maddie, look at her. Oh, Jesus, Maddie, look at her, Ada says, her hands twisting in her apron. Shh, Ada, she's soaked, that's all. They got they got lost in the lake and, and the boat tipped and they, and they swam to shore and she, she must have fainted. Oh, dear Lord, Mrs. Morrison says, her hands coming up to her mouth. Maddie, Ada, why are you standing there like a pair of jackasses, Cook wheezes, heaving her bulky body up the steps. Open the spare room, Maddie, the one off the parlor. Pull the shades and lay an old blanket on the bed. Ada, go fix a pot of coffee and some sandwiches. There's a ham and some chicken in the icebox. Shift yourselves. There are children in the parlor playing hide-and-seek. I chase them out and unlock the door to a small bedroom used by stage drivers or boat captains when the weather's too bad to travel. I realize I've forgotten the blanket and run back to the linen closet for it. I'm back in the room snapping it open over the bare ticking just as Mr. Crabb comes in. I've brought a pillow and a heavy quilt too. She'll be chilled to the bone having slept out all night in wet clothing. Mr. Crabb lays her down on the bed. Cook stretches out her legs and tucks the pillow under her head. The Morrisons come in. Mr. Speary, the Glenman's owner, is right behind them. He stares at her, goes pale, and walks out again. I'll fetch a hot water bottle and some tea and, and brandy, I say, looking at Cook and then Mrs. Morrison and then a painting on the wall, anywhere and everywhere but at the girl. Should I, should I do that? Should I get the brandy? Hush, Maddie. It's too late for that, Cook says. I make myself look at her then. Her eyes are dull and empty. Her skin has gone yellow of a music, her skin has gone the yellow of a muscatel wine. There's an ugly gash in her forehead, and her lips are bruised. Yesterday, she'd sat by herself on the porch, fretting the hem of her skirt. I brought her a glass of lemonade because it was hot outside, and she looked peaked. I hadn't charged her for it. She looked like she didn't have much money. Behind me, Cook Padres, Mr. Crabb. What about the man she was with, Carl Graham? No sign of him, he says. Not yet, leastways. We got the boat. They tipped it all right, in South Bay. I'll have to get a hold of the family, Mrs. Morrison says. They're in Albany. No, that was the only man, Graham, Cook says. A girl lived in South Ostalic. I looked it in the register. Mrs. Morrison nods. I'll ring the operator, see if she can connect me with a store there, or a hotel, or someone who can get a message to the family. What on earth will I say? Oh, dear, her poor, poor mother. She presses a handkerchief to her eyes and hurries from the room. She'll be making a second call before the day's out, Cook said. Ask me, people who can't swim have no business on a lake. 
Too confident, that fellow, Mr. Morrison says. I asked him, could he, you, could he handle a skiff? And he told me yes. Only a darn fool from the city could tip a boat on a calm day. He says more, but I don't hear him. It feels like there are iron bands around my chest. I close my eyes and try to breathe deeply, but it only makes things worse. Behind my eyes, I see a packet of letters tied with a pale blue ribbon. Letters that are upstairs, under my mattress. Letters that I promise to burn. I can see the address on the top one, Chester Gillette, 17 and a half Main Street, Cortland, New York. Cook fusses me away from the body. Maddie, pull the shades like I told you to, she said. She folds Grace Brown's hands over her chest and closes her eyes. There's coffee in the kitchen. And sandwiches, she tells the men. Will you eat something? We'll take something with us, Mrs. Hennessy, if that's all right, Mr. Morrison says. We're going out again. Soon as Speary gets the sheriff on the phone, he's calling Martins, too, to tell him to keep an eye out, and the Higbees and the other camps, just in case Graham made it to shore and got lost in the woods. His name's not Carl Graham. It's Chester. Chester Gillette? The words burst out of me before I can stop them. How do you know that, Maddie? Cook asks. They are all looking at me now. Cook, Mr. Morrison, and Mr. Crabb. I, I heard her call him that, I guess. I stammer, suddenly afraid. Cook's eyes narrow. Did you see something, Maddie? Do you know something you should tell us? What had I seen? Too much. What did I know? Only that knowledge carries a damned high price. Miss Wilcox, my teacher, had taught me so much. Why had she never taught me that? If you're interested in reading the rest of A Northern Light, I hope you pick up a copy from your school library, your favorite indie bookstore, or there's a link down there in the description box. And then uh, run wild and read all of the other amazing books by Jennifer Donnelly, uh, whether picture books, middle grade, young adult, or adult. She has them all and she is a fantastic storyteller. Uh, I hope you enjoy this story and the others on the First Chapter Friday playlist and that you'll come back again next week for another First Chapter Friday video. Happy reading! To continue reading A Northern Light by Jennifer Donnelly, check out a copy from your school library, public library, or purchase it from your local indie bookstore. If you can't find it there, I've got a link in the description box below. This week's mystery quote says, but words are more powerful than anything. Make sure you check out the rest of the First Chapter Friday playlist. I have tons of great middle grade and YA stories waiting for you. One for each week of the year. Please like this video and subscribe so you can stay connected for more great First Chapter Friday videos and other videos you can use in your classroom. Happy reading!